bow my head. Father, uh, we just continue in the spirit of devotion and of focus and uh, of expectation, Father. Uh, we want you to, uh, to speak now, continue to lead us closer to your heart, reveal yourself to us, that we would know our purpose and our plan in you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's been a while, but I, I, I think I still know how to preach. We'll see how it goes. Um, but I did want to share just a few thoughts uh, from the experience on the mission field. Um, uh, the academy during their worship yesterday at chapel, uh, there was some sharing there. So uh, some of the kids have already heard the stories and uh, there were some experiences shared and things like that. But I also wanted to uh, just let you know kind of what we did on our trip and, and where uh, we went um, and some of the experiences. Now, I'm, I'm not going to share this for the whole uh, thing and spend about just 10 minutes with some pictures. I am not good with cell phone pictures, by the way. So this is uh, not a, a great uh, visual experience. Um, and it's hard to summarize 11 days also in a few minutes, but hopefully it'll just give you a taste of, of, of the experience. Um, the Academy arranged a mission trip earlier in the school year, and I had the opportunity of being invited and, and going along with, uh, with the group here um, over the last couple weeks. And we went to the Dominican Republic. I don't know if any of you have ever been there before or if you've traveled much in the Caribbean. Uh, this was my first time to uh, the Dominican Republic um, just so you get your bearings, you see Cuba is over on the left, uh, Puerto Rico is on the right, um, right there, Dominican Republic is, share, is a, a country that shares an island with Haiti. Um, we landed in Santo Domingo, that's the capital, and then we took a five-hour bus ride uh, to where our location was in a community called Barahona um, and uh, got there very late. You know what it's like to travel, 24 hours, airports and layovers and buses and and waiting. So we, we arrived late and tired, but we were uh, there with expectation and, and excitement. Here, here's the group that went. This is everybody, th except I don't see Ezekiel in there somewhere. I don't know where he was hiding. Uh, Simon is, I think, behind Christian there on the, the right side of your screen. But there were 22 of us all together that went. This was the picture here in the parking lot. Um, we left in, in the evening time to catch a midnight flight um, uh, on our way. So we were already kind of uh, tired when we began, but you know, the Lord blesses and uh, we got there. Um, the, the project that we were involved in, there, there, was a, uh, there were multiple schools involved. Uh, the other school, Campion from um, Colorado, their main focus was to do VBS programs and participate with local pastors in an evangelistic series in some of the neighborhood churches. Our task was mostly uh, construction. And the vision of the pastor here was to develop a camp um, he calls it the Southern Missionary Camp, and his desire is to have dormitories, and he wants a church to house a thousand, a basketball court, pool. Um, he has a really big vision. Uh, there, there are other places like this in the Dominican Republic, but nowhere near here, and they're not Christian camps necessarily. Baseball is huge in the Dominican Republic. As a matter of fact, when we were flying in, you know when you fly into Phoenix, you look around, you see pools everywhere? When you fly into the Dominican Republic, you look down and you see baseball fields everywhere. Um, and, and it's just, it's very interesting. And it's kind of a contrast too. I don't know if anyone else uh, on the trip thought of it, but the Dominican Republic is very poor. It's a very poor country. So you'd see shanty towns as you fly in. I mean, just barely houses at all with metal roofs and just shacks. And right next to it, a million dollar baseball field. Um, just beautiful. I mean, better than, than, you know, you would find just on your average high school around here, partly because of, uh, major leagues invests in baseball in the Dominican Republic. And so it's kind of a blessing, but it's also a contrast, you know, here, uh, kids don't have shoes, but they have a baseball field, you know, and it's, it's, I'm not saying it's a good or bad. It's just interesting. Anyways, the camp that Pastor Pachardo wants to develop, it's in process. These were the dormitories that we stayed in. Um, the, the guys stayed in the lower level, girls in the upper level, bathrooms and showers were on the left. To the right was more of the building that's in development. There was a, a meeting uh, room that had tables and chairs. There was a, a, a kitchen where we got our meals. Behind us, uh, behind where this picture is being taken of, is, a, is a, an open space and a wall that we were going to be building. So again, it's hard to capture all of this. Oh, the thing I wanted to point it out. Uh, uh, why I circled it here. No running water. And I don't know what the issue is in Dominican Republic, whether their wells 
just don't get good water or if there's contamination issues. But most of the country depends on purified water that is pumped to these canisters on top of buildings. And then just the gravity flow feeds the sinks and the bathrooms and the showers. Um, so it was all cold showers the whole time there, which was mostly okay because it was hot and humid and somewhat refreshing. But you do want to have a warm shower every now and then. So it was awfully nice when we came back and take the shower. So every day... Uh, a truck would come to pump more water up there because we ran out of water every day. And it was always a race to see that you weren't the, that last one in the shower with, you know, shampoo in your eyes and then all of a sudden no water. So we had to learn that along the way. And it's really good. Part of the mission trip experience is, is understanding that not everyone has the conveniences and the assurances that we have in the United States of running water, hot water, uh, good facilities. The bathrooms were a challenge. Um, and you know that there's a lot of tummy issues that take place when you travel. So um, having uh, about 40 guys use about three toilets and half of them have diarrhea, it was I'm just from the men's experience. I know the ladies had some challenges as well. Uh, but you endure, you endure. And thankfully, there were no major GI outbreaks or anything like that. Uh, you know, you pray and, and God blesses. This is the other side of the building. I think that's Ezekiel moonwalking. I'm not sure what Ezekiel's doing there, but I think that's him. But you can see the kitchen uh, room was here where we got our meals. And our investment as uh, the TAA uh, mission trip was all the kitchen equipment was purchased um, as part of this camp with some of the resources and funds that our kids raised and paid for this trip. So uh, that was a blessing. The building just that is still in construction right there was only built two weeks before we got there. The forms and, and all the scaffolding was there. And then you can see block above there. We put all that block there. One of the students calculated that we moved 22,000 pounds of block while we were there. We had to move the block from the ground level to this platform and then from the platform onto the roof and then from the roof into places that could uh, withstand the weight. And there's going to be additional floors built there, and all the sand and gravel there was for the making of concrete and the building of the wall. Again, I apologize. The pictures are probably really limited. A lot of the days, they didn't have enough work to keep all of our students busy every day, so we'd work in shifts. Um, here, we made sure the Campion group was working hard. We made sure they did their job while we supervised, and that's important because, uh, you know, in Colorado, they need that. But uh, no, we would shift. We would shift and, and get, make concrete. You can see the workers in the background uh, actually putting up the wall. By the way, um, are any of you into construction here? Any of you know construction very much? One or two? So I know what we were doing in the Dominican Republic would not be allowed here. Uh, they were building single case CMU walls that were going at least 15 feet high without any buttresses. So um, uh, they put rebar in it and stuff like that, but uh, some of the walls were going very, very high and and uh, I don't think we would get away with that with our building codes and things like that. But this is what you do. And we were helping and it was a blessing. This is a picture from the roof. You can see all the block there. Uh, every day a truck would come and unload more of that block. And it would be our job to move the block um, to the locations that was being used. You can see the wall in the background. That wall was the wall that was just going higher and higher and higher. And um, uh, the Lord's angels will keep it from falling down, I'm sure. Uh, no, I know they know what they're doing. It's just is it's, it's just different. I grew up with construction and things are. This is another picture of the roof. You can see the ocean in the background. About a 15 minute walk or so to the ocean, which we took advantage of uh, virtually every day to rinse the sweat off, to cool down from the humidity. And it was a beautiful, beautiful beach. This is in the meeting room, taking our meals. The food was pretty good, I'd say, uh, from my perspective. I thought the pineapple was some of the best uh, that I remember. Fresh pineapple. Um, there were days, though, where it was just so different. I don't know. I didn't know how many ways you could cook with banana. I, I didn't realize how versatile banana was. Um, and I would try most everything that the chef prepared, but I will admit not all of it got eaten. Um, but it was mostly good. Uh, some of us did have some tummy issues and had to be very careful about what we ate at some point. I will let you know, praise the Lord, I lost five pounds five pounds on the mission field. Glory to God. Give it to him. I just need about four or five more mission trips and I'll be at my goal. So um, 
But uh, really, the cooks were super nice, and, and they tried to be very accommodating. Oh, I'll just say one thing. Most of the, the food was stuff we were not familiar with, but about the third or fourth day, they broke out Coca-Cola. And I'll tell you, having a drink of Coca-Cola and having something familiar was really refreshing. I enjoyed that. Our first Sabbath, uh, just a, a quick mention on our first Sabbath there, we took a hike up into the mountain uh, right next to the camp. And it was a beautiful hike, beautiful experience. There's Damien um, smiling and with the ocean in the background. We camped or we set up under a mango tree to have our worship. And some of the boys, of, co- of course, had to reenact Zacchaeus and go up into the tree and And they wanted to listen to that. But the thing I'll remember is that we're all sitting there singing together and and there were some devotionals being shared. And I think Pastor Carlos was speaking um, and and just sharing a message. And all of a sudden, there was kind of a a scream and a a shout and a jump. And then in the middle of of all these kids sitting there, they all jumped and and went in different directions. Uh, That's because these centipedes, can you see? Oops, I didn't mean to go back. Go back. You see, it's kind of hard to see in the red. The, those centipedes are no joke. They were, they were quite common. You see them both alive and dead. They're, I mean, some of them were about a foot long, wouldn't you say? Um, I had Ezekiel put his hand uh, toward one so I could get scale in one picture, but I didn't put it up here. Um, and they're not poisonous, but they're very painful if you get bit, and they can make you sick. Anyways, so out of the grass and brush, this centipede comes crawling, and all, everyone scatters and screams. And uh, I don't think anyone remembers what Pastor Carlos said after that. So, um, but a- another experience dealing with uh, just a different climate and a different uh, setting. We did do some excursions. We went to a waterfall. This is Pastor Pachardo in the background there. I know it's hard to see. He was kind of the, the local leader. It's his vision of developing this camp. And he invited us and arranged some of these tours. And then uh, he tried to illustrate getting in the water on the right. So it's kind of monkey see, monkey do. He went into the water, uh, and then a bunch of kids also got in there and uh, had a great time. So it was a a great relaxation to get away and see that. A weird thing that he had us do, I just thought I'd throw these pictures up. So on Friday, he announces to us, by the way, guys, we're going to do something today. We're going to get in the Guinness Book of World Records. And we're like, what are you talking about? So apparently, someone in the community there has what has been certified as the smallest car in the world. Okay, it's made in India, and apparently it is certified as the smallest operational street-worthy car or whatever. And they were going to see how many people they could transport in and on this car and then submit it to Guinness World Book of Records. Mission trip. Yeah. It was just, it took about 15 minutes or so. And I don't know what the final count was. I think they had to drive so far and the car had to operate. The doors had to be closed. But I don't know how many people they got inside the car. And I know it's faded. It's hard to see. But they probably had 10, 12 stacked in that car. Of course, we put the, the, the smallest stature ones in the car, and then they loaded six or seven on top. And we'll see, maybe someday we'll be showing a picture of Guinness World Book of Records with uh, some of our kids uh, there. But uh, that was just one of the fun things we did. Another excursion is we went to a beautiful beach called Las Aguilas, um, or the Eagles Bay. Um, it took a little boat ride to get there. And uh, of course, uh, this is the Caribbean, just uh, extremely beautiful water, very clear experience. This was, uh, this was the day of sunburns, and it was late in the experience, but pretty much everyone uh, experienced sunburn to some degree, some quite severe, but thankfully uh, are recovering. Um, I still have it on my hands and nose and ears a little bit. Uh, and even though we were trying to stay up on all the sunblock, it was just uh, a lot of exposure. But uh, a beautiful experience that we got to have as part of the country of the Dominican Republic. So we were glad to be able to participate in the construction. Several of our girls were needed as translators if they were bilingual. So a lot of our girls did, did go with the VBS group to the churches and help with the evangelistic series. I think there were 24 baptisms at the end of the week. Um, so uh, we're just thankful that God uh, was moving in that community and uh, the locals were very receptive. We, we did our own worship at camp every night. We did most of it outside. It was just a lot cooler than going indoors. Uh, you get a little bit of a breeze. Um, and so these are some of the Campion people uh, along with us there. And uh, we just uh, we had a great time. And then it was home again, home again, jiggity jig. So um, the hardest part of getting home was customs in Miami. They gave us the biggest challenge. And um, it's just really, really weird doing 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 international travel right now. 
Uh, it's just really weird. So we had some troubles in customs, but we came back, I think, with everyone that we left with. Did, did we get everyone, Anissa? I think we got everyone. So we all came back home. So it was a wonderful experience. I know some of the kids have stories to share. I think there's more pictures uh, that, that may be being put together, but um, uh, these mission trips are very impactful in the lives of those that, that can go and live in different uh, cultures and experiences, and then uh, being able to share and help with the projects that we're involved with. So that's what uh, the, the, the myself and 21 others uh, were doing over the last couple weeks, uh, and I know we're all glad to be home, although I know some of us are still adjusting uh, to uh, getting back to our old routines and things like that, which is, is normal. So um, praise the Lord that we got to have that experience. How many of you have ever been on a mission trip? Wouldn't it be fun if we arranged a church mission trip? All right, who's going to be in charge of that? Isabel, I saw your hand. You see, if you raise your hand and volunteer someone else, then... I think it'd be great. Some churches do that. There's all kinds of things that you can do, and either history tours or missionary trips or, or things like that. So, well, I uh, just wanted to share that with you. Um, it wasn't uh, it wasn't just a, a two week vacation. It was actually uh, joining with this great experience. I uh, just share a verse that goes along with it. God was in Christ reconciling the world to Himself. Therefore, we. How many of you are part of the we? Isn't that all of us? If you love Jesus, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us. So we carry the same ministry that Jesus Christ. He takes that ministry from the Father, he accomplishes his will, and then he hands it to us and says, I want you to follow in the same ministry of reconciliation yourself. So there's many ways that we can do that. We don't have to go to a foreign country. We don't have to do that. Uh, but those are ways that we can join in being ambassadors for Jesus Christ. Well, um, I do want to share a, a message also with you today, and I, I did shorten it uh, because I knew there would be a limited time, Vince, so don't, don't worry. You're, we're going to get to potluck. It's going to be all right. Um, but in, in, in the context of the season which we're in, in context of uh, the focus of uh, the holiday of the Easter weekend that's coming up, I wanted to talk about the cross, and I'm looking forward to the experiences this coming week with communion and then uh, our worship service next week as well. So uh, George, George actually did a kid's quiz last week. Were you here last week? I, I thought that was really sweet of him to incorporate that. I know there are some challenges with the clicker and things like that, but I do have a question for you, and we're just going to make this kind of informal, but I want to give the kids a chance. Jaden, you want to help out? Thank you. I see not a whole lot of kids helped out with, with children's church, or, I'm sorry, not children's church, with children's offering, and, and others, but I know there's some young people here, and this is open to all the kids. Just tell me what you know about Paul. Just tell me anything you can think about about the Apostle Paul that he's known for or made him great or he was just, you know, an experience or something that just makes Paul stand out. Oh, I've already forgotten. Uh, Trace, Trace, Samantha, Sally, Gracie, Gracie. It really doesn't matter, but Paul was the first missionary. Ah, first missionary. Well done. Someone's listening. I like it. Anyone else? Something you know about Paul, something that made him great. Is that Harper back there? Always can depend on Harper. I love it. Um, when it was the end, he, he helped every, um, everyone who... He helped a lot of those people. He did. He was a helper, wasn't he? That's good. All right, Abel? He was blinded by God, and his name was changed to Saul. All right. Well, yeah, he's known as Saul and, and as Paul. Yes. Um, I see your brother up here, Jaden, Isaiah. Kids quiz, Darren. Come on. Get he's with the program. Great. He's great at making tents. He was great at making tents. Oh, that's wonderful. What are we teaching our children these days? Owen? World's best snake thrower. World's best snake thrower? Thrower. Okay. 
world's best snake thrower. Very interesting. All right, Nico. Toby's coming around here. Um, he made a lot of the books of the Bible. He wrote books of the Bible. That's pretty important, isn't it? How many of you have ever done that? No one? All right, I see. Is Addy? Okay. You guys should be, you know, covering different sides. This is like, this is like when the second baseman and shortstop, you know, shortstop don't communicate. It just throws this whole thing off. Okay, Addy. No, come on. Wow. Who corrupted you? Anything else? Is this all? Is this all we know about Paul? Is this is this the highlights? Let's take one more. Okay, right here. Yeah. He was a Roman citizen. He was a Roman citizen. Well, we got some of the basics here. We got some of them. Oh, and we have one more. Ab. He survived a shipwreck. He survived a shipwreck. We're kind of getting it to it now, aren't we? Kind of refreshing the memory of this pretty important guy in the Bible. All right, Jade and Toby, thank you very much. You can just set the mics on the front pew. There's a lot more that we could talk about. I know that you get caught off guard with these. You're not always thinking of them, and it takes a while for the brain to freshen up. But he was a pretty important guy in the Bible. He had a lot of faith and courage. You talk about uh, he was lowered over the wall in a basket. His life was often under threat. Um, He was stoned many times. Uh, He did work miracles. He made many miracles, actually. Um, Raised the dead. Um, the snake that had bit him on Malta and he shook it off into the fire. I'm not sure, Owen, about the throwing, but you know, we'll go with it. He shook it into the fire. Um, he had visions. He was a preacher, obviously, writes a lot of the Bible. So he knows, uh, the things of God, theology, leadership, and example. Lots of ways that you could say this guy was a big deal. This guy was a big deal in the church, in the community. Paul's one of the greatest models of faith in the Bible. He had a lot that he could brag about. A lot that he could say, hey, I've done some pretty important things. I mean, have you ever opened prison doors through singing? As uh, Jackie mentioned during our our worship time. Have you? He did. He and Silas. Have you ever shaken a serpent into the fire? Have you ever written a book of the Bible? Have you ever preached? Probably to millions when you add up all of his travels, all of the communities he preached to. Uh, probably in the millions. Have you survived all the trials that he went through, the stonings and uh, uh, the, the whippings and the shipwrecks? And yes, have you ever raised the dead to life? I mean, this guy, he's a pretty big deal. Did some pretty amazing things. But even before he became a believer in Jesus, he had a lot to brag about as well. And he talks about that in his past experience. And he talks about his reasons for having pride before he became a Christian. If anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. In the status of Judaism, these qualities he mentions would have made him extremely important. He was circumcised appropriately, right on time, as as Jewish law indicated on the eighth day. He was of the nation of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews as to the law, a Pharisee as to zeal. He was willing to persecute the church as to righteousness, which is found in the law. He says, I was blameless. No problems whatsoever. And then he meets Jesus. Then he understands in a better light exactly what these things were all about. So then he says this, whatever things were gained to me, and, that, and the gain was the previous things he mentioned. Those things were extremely important in that culture, in that community, to be able to say, I am of Abraham. I am of the promised people. I am a part of the temple. I am a Jew. I have been circumcised. I have the law. All of these things gave you status. All of these things separated you from the lower classes. You're just a dirty Gentile. You're a pagan. You're a heathen. I am circumcised. I am of Abraham. And he says, all those things that were gain to me, all those things that were advantages to me, now that I see them in a new light, they, I now count them as loss. And the word loss there is actually the word that we would use in a business context of like damages, loss of damages. If you ever like had to take your car and to get repaired and they say, oh, it needs this, this, and that. And you say, okay, well, what are the damages? 
right? What are the damages? What is the actual damage? What is the loss? So he says these things, I'm not even saying are of low value or no value. They are actually of negative value in the context of understanding the value of Jesus Christ. So whether before the cross or even after the cross, Paul had a lot that he could point to and say, uh, you know, I've got it together. I've got a lot that I can share. I have a lot that I can boast about. But what was his only confidence and glory? Just looking at the example of Paul and all the things that he had going for him, I want to just draw to one specific verse in the Bible that caught my attention this week, gave me a, a chance to pause and meditate it on, meditate on, and I want to invite you to do the same thing. It comes from Galatians, probably the first book that he wrote. There's a debate between whether it was Galatians or 1 Thessalonians. We don't really know. We just go by tradition and in history and things like that. But almost for sure, Galatians was the first, if not one of the first books that he ever wrote. And in Galatians, toward the very end of the book, after he's already talked about, you know, faith in Jesus Christ and who has bewitched you. And if anyone teaches the gospel, then the one that you've heard, uh, then they are accursed. And, and here are the fruits of the spirit and all the things that you find in Galatians. All right. And then toward the end of it, he says this verse. Okay. Galatians 6, 14, but may it never be that I would boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Now, I want you to read this for a second. I want you to think about this verse for a second. Just take a moment. May it never be that I would boast, except in the cross, the cross of Jesus, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. This is a man who has been deeply changed in his life. This is a man who has gone from understanding the way of God as merit-based and as ethnic-based and as law-based to being completely overwhelmed by grace completely overwhelmed by grace. And it all stems from his understanding of the cross of Jesus. It was not in the law that Paul found grace. It was not in Sinai. It was not in the sanctuary. It was not in circumcision. All those things have purpose. All those things have meaning. But it was in his contemplation and revelation of one single reality that changed him forever. When he says be it, that I would never boast, he's not just talking about bragging. We think about boasting sometimes as bragging. You know, I'm better than you, and I'm, I'm taller, I'm richer, I'm smarter, whatever. That, we boast like that, kind of like we brag. But what he's really saying is talking about his confidence. Be it never be that I would have any confidence in anything other than this. I will not establish myself. I will not set a foundation for my life on anything else but this. I will not orient my life towards any other reality than this. I have nothing else to boast of but this one thing, the cross of Jesus Christ. And through that realization, through that focus, through that devotion and dedication, now I have nothing in the world and the world has nothing in me. I am completely removed. And when we talk about the world, we mean that the brokenness, the sin, the selfishness, that which is decaying. Obviously, he loved people. People are part of the world, and he wanted to, to see people redeemed. But he's talking about the part of the world that belongs to Satan, the part of the world that's perishing, that's going away. He says, now there's nothing about this world that I have any interest in, and the world has nothing to do with me. That's powerful. You live your life differently when you have this focus. You live your life 
in a changed way when you appreciate the meaning of the cross. The cross of Jesus is not just part of the gospel. Okay? And we sometimes fall into this trap of, oh, we have our beliefs, we have this belief, creation, and we have uh, uh, you know, healthy living, and we have our, our, our principles, and we have our doctrine, and then we have the cross, and then we have the second coming, and it's one of the mix. But that is, a, that is a fallacy, that is a trap. That, in a way, does lead to legalism. The cross is not just a part of the gospel. The cross is the gospel. Okay, this side gets it. Over here, we're going to pray that you get it as well. It is the central, it is the singularity of the message of the gospel. It is the supreme manifestation of God's love. We can say it in so many different ways, but devoid of a focus and connectivity with the cross, any doctrine that we have falls short. Any teaching, any reality, any lifestyle, any expression of our faith that that somehow neglects the priority and importance of the cross will fall short. And it doesn't mean that we can just, you know, tear out the parts of our Bible that don't, you know, directly manifest, you know, parts of the Bible and say, well, I guess we don't need uh, Esther. Let's just root tear Esther out. I don't see that. Oh, and I don't see anything in there in Judges, and I'm going to rip that out. And, oh, in Revelation, well, there is a lamb slain from that, but a lot of Revelation, we should rip that out because it doesn't centralize on the cross. That's not what I'm saying at all. We still need these other realities, but we have to see them in the light of the cross. We need Sinai. We need the law. We need the Sabbath. But if you take away the cross and the overarching meaning of the cross, and then all you're left with is law, you get a burden. You get a millstone. You get a curse. You, if you take prophecy and say, we're going to be dedicated to prophecy and to evangelism and understanding last day events, if you do that devoid of the cross, you're not giving people Jesus. You're giving them something else. You're giving them predictions and dates and times and history and analogy, but you're not giving them Jesus. The cross is all that dictates our understanding of the love of God, and that is not secondary. The cross is the answer to Satan. It's the antidote to sin. It's the catalyst of all conversion and the conduit through which God establishes redemption in our lives. It is the hope of the sinners. It is the boast of believers, which is why Paul says in the New Testament, it was a mystery to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. They didn't get it. It is the beginning of our faith. It is the end of the gospel. It is the glory of heaven. It is the doom of hell. All truth, all scripture, all doctrine culminates in and at the cross. It is the central singular reality of our faith. And anytime we shift away from it, you know, um, we've been talking about we're having a special service next week and the Easter weekend is coming and for most of, uh, of people who have uh, somewhat of a casual relationship with the church or a casual relationship uh, with their religion and their faith, uh, they will uh, embrace a certain emphasis and reality of the cross once a year. Easter, right? Easter, yeah, okay, so uh, maybe, I, maybe I practice Lent. Uh, maybe I'm Catholic and I go through the, the stations of the cross Um, uh, maybe my church does this thing. So for one season, for one weekend, for one moment, the cross is going to take priority in my life. But that mentality or that reality is not going to be sufficient as far as what the Bible says when it comes to our relationship with understanding the cross. How often should we be dedicated to focusing on understanding the meaning and power of the cross? Every single day. Every single day. Every single Sabbath, every single Bible study, every sign we pray, every worship service, their cross must have priority and significance in everything that we say and do. And so everything has to lead to this one reality. And so in this time of, of, of extra emphasis, I wanted to remind us of this reality. Paul earlier said in 1 Corinthians, or, or when he writes 1 Corinthians, I determined... He says to the Corinthian church, Gentiles now here, mostly Gentiles in the Corinthian church, I determined to know nothing among you except what? The cross. 
Uh, nothing. I desire to know nothing among you except to be a man, a, a, an example and a teacher and a leader in helping you appreciate the power and the meaning and the passion of the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. It has to start there. Yes, I can give you the health message. And yes, I can give you other realities. And I can give you the law. And I can give you uh, uh, the, the fruit of the Spirit. And I can give you the armor of God. I can give you all these things. But you got to start with and you got to finish with the cross. If I make any other message, if you receive any other message, but you miss the cross, you miss the whole thing. You've missed the whole thing. And this is exactly what happened when Jesus came to this earth. Did the Jews have the sanctuary? That wasn't meant to be solely rhetorical. Did the Jews have the sanctuary? Thank you. I haven't put you to sleep yet. Did the Jews have the law? Oh, did the Jews have the prophets? Ah, oh, see? But did the Jews accept Jesus? Yeah, some did. Thank you for being that oppositional person, Mrs. Johnson. Of course, some did. But you have to understand the plan of God. And it begins with the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. It was something that many struggled to understand, and it should be the focus of our deep-seated devotion and religion today. Paul said, I determined to know nothing. I will not move one iota off this. I must know Jesus and him crucified. Everything else is secondary to that. And they have, again, it's not to say that those other realities don't have their place. And they help uh, build up our understanding and appreciation of the cross. But we cannot take the cross away and make it devoid of that. It would be well, many of you have heard this before, for us to spend a thoughtful hour each year in contemplation of the life of Christ. I've got to make sure you're listening. How often should we spend a thoughtful hour each and every day in contemplation of all the works of Jesus Christ, his entire life? We should take it point by point, let the imagination grasp each scene, especially the closing ones, right? Especially the sacrifice, the passion, the final week, the triumphal entry, the trial, all of the elements, the sayings of the cross especially the closing ones. And as, as we thus dwell upon his great sacrifice for us, our confidence in him will be, more con will be more constant. How many of you could use more confidence today? You want to know where it's found? It's found at the cross. Our love will be quickened. How many of you could use more love? Oh, not so many out there needing more love. I see. Plenty of love out here. You're all thinking, I don't need more love. It's all them out there. They need more love. Um, I won't say who, but someone sent me a funny little meme uh, earlier last week that said, why is it when I'm at home, I tend to think, oh, Lord, would you just bless the whole world, save the world for your grace? But then when I get in my car, I think to myself, oh, Lord, would you get all these idiots out of my way? Well, you laugh because it's true. <laughs> do we need more love? We need more love. Where do you find more love? It's at the cross. We shall be more deeply imbued with his spirit. I could use more of his spirit. If we would be saved at last, we must learn the lesson of penitence and humiliation at the foot of the cross. One more. Looking upon, and by the way, this one is in the context of communion here um, in this passage. This is also from Desire of Ages. And, and she's talking about it in the context of communion. Looking upon the crucified Redeemer, we more fully comprehend the magnitude and meaning of the sacrifice made by the majesty of heaven. The plan of salvation is glorified before us, and the thought of Calvary awakens living and sacred emotions in our hearts. Praise to God and the Lamb will be in our hearts and on our lips, for pride and self-worship cannot flourish in the soul that keeps fresh in memory the scenes of Calvary. Isn't that true? Pride and self-worship cannot flourish upon in the hearts of those who are truly focused in understanding the meaning and power and message of the cross. Because everything about the cross is, is opposed to self-worship and pride. This is, this is simply academic. 
We as a people need to be leaders in this. We as believers, as Seventh-day Adventists, we should be leaders in our community, in our church, and in our faith in focusing on the cross and seeing the pride and the vanity and the selfishness melt away as the Holy Spirit reveals to us the meaning and power and beauty of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. It is a subject of which there is no end. We will never fathom the bottom of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and all the connected beautiful elements that go along with it. All the passages and stories that build and all the culmination of the reality of the the, uh, manifestation of the power of Jesus' sacrifice and resurrection to us that we experience today. This week, we have a couple of opportunities as a community to remind ourselves and fellowship together in a focus to learn more about what the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross meant. We have our communion service coming up. A Thursday's weird, but this is the second or maybe third year in a row that we've done, second year in a row that we've done a Thursday communion because that's the, the day when the first communion took place, when Jesus Uh, instituted the Lord's Supper. It happened to be on a Thursday. So we're just kind of following that pattern. And so we're going to have a service in our fellowship hall. Come, fellowship with us. Experience that together. And then next Sabbath, as I've been mentioning, we're going to have a a wonderful opportunity to continue in this. So join us in contemplating, celebrating, and keeping fresh the meaning and power of the cross of Calvary.